It's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with the great Val Garay. <laughs> the great. Yeah, you like that? Hey, Warren, I love that. Yeah. Now, we, we were talking briefly and we touched upon a, a record that you made by a band called Mr. Big. Yeah, I produced that early on in my producer career. What year was that, 77? 76. 76. I did it in 76. It came out in 77. Yeah. And that, that was a big record for me. Yeah, it was a big record in the UK, like I was telling you. <clears throat> it was number one on the BBC for like, I don't know, 15 weeks, and then they took it off because of the lyrics. Just because it said, step, step back, back inside, inside me, Romeo, Romeo she, she said. said yeah. what, is, what could that mean? I, I don't know. And there was something like, seemed, take me to your take bed. Take me to your bed, yeah. yeah. But it just seemed very innocent to me, you know, like, it's a love song. It's like the doors with the, uh, um, come on baby, you know, light my fire, let me take you higher. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Let's spend the night together. It was fun. <laughs> it was a good record. So uh, we touched on that briefly, but I do actually know a lot of your records. We didn't mm. really talk about that before because I wanted to save it for camera. Um, I also did some stuff with Peter about three years ago because the band I work with, The Fray, he did that Buddy Holly covers record. I think you probably right, did some stuff Right, right. Yeah, he, he had a bunch of people that did that, right? Yeah. Different artists. Yeah, so the band... Tribute I worked with the record. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to work with him. And, but I, like you, am an aficionado of, you know, Sunset Sound and, and of course, Sunset Sound Factory or Sound Factory. Well, it? yeah, it was the Sound Factory. Sunset Sound didn't own it then. Yeah. yeah. And so when I would go in there, the, the, the walls are covered, probably about 90% of records you made. Yeah. Yeah, I had a serious run there. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Rind it goes, Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, James Taylor, James Taylor. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's insane. Yeah. And it sort of... If the so, walls could talk, right? If those walls could talk. So I think a nice segue. You can tell me whether this is true, but this is what they tell me. When you oh, go my there. God. Here we, these <laughs> stories, it's unbelievable some of the things people have said to me like this. Hey, you're not going to believe this, but they said, you know... But I think this is supposed to be a compliment. They, they, they said that you loved the room, and it was pretty much your room. You mm -hmm. were working there constantly, mm -hmm. making all those amazing records. Right. Like I said, I'm not exaggerating. If you go and look at the walls, it's just covered with your records. But they said that you loved the room so much that you took the dimensions of the room and made your own room. Well, is that true? <clears throat> the truth, yes, the, yeah, that that's true in a way. But I'll tell you the truth of that. Great. Um, when when I went to work with Dave Hassinger, <clears throat> and he redid that room, he did it with George Augsburger. I don't know if you know who George of Augsburger. Of course, okay. yeah, absolutely. And George uh, did drawings before the room was built. And John and Terry are the carpenters that built it. And so I got a copy of the drawing. Oh, wow. So I, I love the sound of that control room. So when I built record one, I wanted it exactly the same. So I simply took the drawing, uh, sat down at a drafting table because I have a, you know, a, a minor in architecture. And, and when I did record one, I drew the whole thing. Then I had to hire... Um, um, an architect because he could get it through plan check, but I basically drew it and All I did was copy the control room was copy the drawings that George had done dimensionally I see so I had all the dimensions and it was you know nothing to do that and how did it feel was when it was completed? Did you well, the only thing that I changed I made two um, Two basic changes one was a mistake and one was a, a really good and it took me 30 years to figure out the mistake, how I how I did it, and what I did wrong. But you, you have to imagine that the control room at the sound factory was copied probably to within a quarter of an inch. Wow. In terms of dimension, in terms of uh, materials. The only thing is, is that the walls in the sound factory <clears throat> were paneled with random length and width um, walnut, which is a dark wood. And I wanted it light because I was tired of working in these nightclub studios. I relate so to record that. one was all white and the control room was light oak. Same company in Arkansas that made the wood, all random length width. And there was no problem because it was almost the same porosity as the, as the walnut. Um, but when you sat in the control room at the sound factory where the super reds sat in the soffits, the box was open to the control room. So they basically cut the hole because it was an afterthought when they did it at the, at the sound factory and stuck the box in so the, the, the thing that faced you 
was the two speakers, the 604 and the woofer, sitting in the box. Right. So what I did, and then when I finished the control record one, finally fired it up, it didn't sound right. And I could not figure it out. And I, there wasn't the same top end in it. So I had this poor guy who was the painter, water white lacquer, the whole wood part of the room, which brought the top end up enough to where I was happy with it. But years later, I figured it out. I paneled over the boxes and cut the holes in them, the paneling, the oak, to stick the speakers in the boxes. So you could see two speakers, but you never saw the box. Well, putting that paneling over the face of that mm -hmm. box created the, the, the vibration of the box from, it dampened it somehow. I see. Changed the sound. So it wasn't the live room, it was the control room. Yeah. And then the shape of the live room was identical to the sound factory, just bigger. In um, other words, if you sat in the control room, mm -hmm. the studio was here and went down the right side yep. with a wall, and then behind you was a vocal booth. So I yep. did the exact same circle, yep. except that in the sound factory from the doors going into the studio to that far wall was like 25 feet, and now it's 40. Oh, I see. Which made the room to the right wider, and the room behind you was exactly the same size as the width of the control room. As you see, all the wood was oak. And everything on the console, the original API, I'm the one that came up with this idea of painting the mm -hmm. API console. I went to API and said, I want to change the color. They said, do whatever you want. <laughs> and my day planner uh, happened to have that color on the pages. So I sent them that and they found a military spec that matched it. Uh -huh. And that was the first console that API ever made that was cream coated. They, they made a bunch of them after that. Because I, I got tired of all the dark everything. You know? What year was this? 1980 is when that opened. And as you can see, the living room was all very light colored, and the kitchen was all the same, and the back big room was different. But you can see, it's just like looking out the window in the sound factory, except there was a room through that window, which there wasn't at the sound factory. Yeah. I, who has it now? Who has record one now? <clears throat> I sold it to Alan Sides. Oh, you did? Yeah. But he did, he's, isn't he out of the game now? I know he... Huh? Didn't he sell it? Uh, he tried. Oh, he tried. But uh, he wanted too much money and nobody would pay for it. Right. But I spent $3 million building that in 1980. That's a lot of money. Then, yeah. Especially in 1980. Yeah. That's a huge amount. They still have the console in there? No. Oh. He tore out that control room and studio and flipped it around and put the control room out that way and made the studio this way and turned it into some weird room with an SSL. The only room he didn't change was the back room, which is this huge room that had a Neve. I had an API, he just put a giant Neve in it. So that room remained basically the same. Crazy, I mean I- And it's a shame that he ruined that room because that was an incredible room. And in a, in a five year period, the record of the year came out of that three, or f three out of five years. Yeah, I've, I, you know, that doesn't really cease to amaze me, to be honest. I'm even going to Ocean Way now, what they're calling it now, United, back to United. Um, you know, they, he sold the original console that was in there that made mm -hmm. all those great, great records. Well, that console is in Herb Alpert's house. Oh, nice. Well, this has got somebody. And the one in the back room, the API in the back room, is in Nashville at uh, David Briggs Studio. Yeah, I mean, APIs. Beautiful front end. I mean, amazing sounding consoles. Yeah, the, there's nothing that sounded that good. I mean, when you the, all these people with SSLs, they just like bells and whistles, you know. But well, the front end of those early yeah. ones were yeah. horrible. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I don't. I I have an SSL in my house, but I don't ever track using a mic pre on it. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's APIs, you know, three twelves, mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, ten seventy threes. I mean, that just well, we use so these. Um, I have an API, an original 312, but uh, we use these uh, modified ones that the BAE makes with the Vita SOP amps. And in fact, we're testing a new pair, the red knob ones that are brand new ones that Avitas just came out with. Fantastic. So you made some of the biggest selling, best sounding records of the 70s, if you don't mind me saying. Thank you. And um, 80s. And 80s as well, but for me it's like that golden period growing up in England, mm -hmm. you know, because of my age group, you know, I was looking back and trying to figure out how to make great sounding albums, which, you know, I don't know if I've ever done, but isn't that kind of the thing where I was trying to strive for something more? So the question is, what inspired you? How did you 
get started? What made you want to do this? Um, <clears throat> you mean what, originally? Yeah. Well, my father was a singer and an actor his whole life, and he was very successful, but, uh, you know, he did 30 films, and when he, when it came time for, you know, people would ask him, what's your son going to do? He said, my son's going to be a doctor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to be in the entertainment business. So um, basically out of high school, I went to Stanford School of Medicine uh, in um, Northern California. And probably in the middle of my <clears throat> second year of graduate school, I met a cocktail waitress who got me involved in this band with a bunch of friends of mine and got in a band. And the next thing I knew, I was hooked on the Beatles and the music and dropped out of college and... A familiar and story of musicians. And ended up in the music <laughs> business. <laughs> and did you um, assist at studios? Is that how you got Well, started? no. I was in bands first. And right. I did that for about seven years. Uh, some really big bands. And then moved uh, from Northern California to Southern California. And I was in bands here. And then uh, I got tired of struggling with, you know, three or four other people, depending on, the, you know, your life depends on them. So then I started writing and I got signed to uh, Warner Tamerlane for a couple of years, and then I got signed to uh, April Blackwood for a couple of years, which is the CBS publishing affiliate at the time. And then uh, a guy decided he wanted to manage me, and he knew Dave Hassinger from the Rolling Stones era because he used to he used to be partnered with Andrew Lou Goldham and work with the Stones in this in the '60s and uh, late '60s, and so. Unbeknownst to most people, all the hits that the Stones did were not done in England. They were done in Hollywood at RCA Studios. Satisfaction, Under My Thumb, 19 Nervous Breakdown, and all, all those great classic Stones records. Yeah, wonderful records. <clears throat> and Dave Hassinger was the guy who did them. He also did The Monkees. He also did um, the first three Grateful Dead records. He also did uh, the first couple of Jefferson Airplane records. And he was moonlighting as a producer at night, working as a staff engineer for RCA during the day. And he found a group, made a hit record with them, and made a bunch of money. And then Mo Austin hired him as a staff producer at Warner Brothers. And that's when he started working with the Grateful Dead. And after an album and a half with them and their insanity, he basically <laughs> flipped them off in a studio in New York and went back to L.A. and bought the Sound Factory, which at the time was called Moonglow. Moonglow. Which is, yeah, which is where all the Righteous Brothers were done oh, in the 60s. Wonderful stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so then he redid the the studio a bit. Um, when I first went there, it was a Domitio custom console with API components in it. Oh wow! Like sunset. Big round knobs, yeah. four little buttons, no panning, you know, mix mono, everything. So <clears throat> uh, I went in there with this guy who was managing me, and he had a friend who was an agent and the agent had a couple artists that they got me to be able to produce. One was Johnny Tillotson and the other was Evie Sands. So I'm in there producing records uh, with Dave Hassinger as the engineer and I kind of came to the conclusion that this was going to go nowhere fast. <laughs> so in the process of doing that, uh, Dave said to me one time, he said, you know, you got great ears. Why don't you come to work for me and I'll teach you to be an engineer. And I went, okay. So then I went to work for him for $100 a week and was running up to the corner getting sandwiches. And, and uh, I finally found a band that I wanted to work with and I brought them in for my first project, which is a band called El Chicano. And uh, the first single off that album became a big hit, which was a remake of uh, Van Morrison's Brown Eyed Girl. Oh, wonderful song. And so um, from that, uh, Dave kind of woke up to the fact that I did have talent and then Peter and Linda came in to work with Dave Hassinger on Heart Like a Wheel. And Dave was about 55 at the time and was kind of done working. He didn't want to do it anymore, you know. So he kept pawning me off on them and, and you know, disappearing and going home. <laughs> and finally, after a couple of weeks, Peter called him up and said, listen, you can stay home. I like this guy. And so then I did that record and that went through the roof. And then I did the next one, and that went through the roof. Two platinum records, two number one albums, number one singles, and then it just started rolling, you know. And you and Peter did a lot of albums together. Ten years we worked together in that room, or eight years, something like that. And, you know, then when I built Record One, 
Um, he I came, saw that Randy Meisner <clears throat> solo record on your resume as well, which I didn't know you had done until today, and I was like, that's a great record. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it had two hit singles on it, and yeah. it was his first solo record. I mean, his story is incredible. Yeah. From I've known time. Randy since he moved here from Nebraska. Wow. Because, see, I was in the beginning of this whole mu music scene. I, I lived on Formosa Street, Neil Young, Dick Davis in the Buffalo Springfield era. We all kind of shared an apartment downstairs. And um, that was like before, it was right, right after the first Buffalo Springfield record. Um, and then Richie and I became really good friends because he and I were born on the same day. So we just became fast friends. And then as the Buffalo Springfield started breaking up, um, I started working on Richie's stuff with him. And then years later, Richie came to me to produce his solo record. And when Randy left the Eagles, he called me up because uh, Frank Rand was the head of Epic out here and he and I were friends. And he said, you gotta produce Randy's record. I went, okay. So Randy was, you know, trying to write and not having a lot of success at it, so I hooked him up with Eric Kaz. Do you know who Eric Kaz is? Yeah. yeah. And he and Eric wrote Hearts on Fire, <coughs> which was a, you know, top ten single in that record. <coughs> and Randy was managed by Trudy Green at the time. Trudy! <coughs> yeah. I just did an Aerosmith record. Yeah. Trudy. She was managing Randy. I didn't know she managed him. Yeah. That's crazy. So, you know... We'll put some links and stuff below the video so people can understand. But essentially, for me, growing up in England, your name is synonymous to the sound of the 70s in Los Angeles for me. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at all those records and listening to all those records. Because, you know, when I'm a kid, when, when people used to buy vinyl... You, yeah, you'd look at who did them. You'd look at everything. Yeah. You know, you used to know who the assistant was, if they credited them, the engineer, the producer, the studio, everything. Mm -hmm. And it, Which is a big thing that I'm getting involved with at Neris now, because of all the the way they they spread data now and where it's going, because um, that's a problem. It really is. Yeah. Well, I'm working on that with Maureen Droney, and that's wonderful yeah. because yes, it's very difficult because if you're, you know, a younger guy trying to come up here. Yeah. Nobody knows who you are. Yeah. People build websites. No disrespect to the people who do this. But they build websites and they put a whole bunch of credits and you know you don't there's no way to check what they actually did on those records you know there's a lot of lot well of, that's the name game you know yeah in in this business like uh i know people that have you know um did a guitar overdub and then they used that album on their discography <laughs> Sure. It's something they did. I, I wouldn't do that myself because, right. you know, if I put a record down, it's because I did that record, you know, or I, I did the bulk of it, you know. It's funny because Brandon and I were laughing the other day. <clears throat> I did a track on this new um, uh, Loder Kellerman record, which he's a, a flautist from Joburg, South Africa. Wow. And last year he won the Grammy for Best New Age Album. Oh, he did? Yeah, him and Ricky Cash won it. And... So he came to me after that and we started chatting on Facebook and then he said, you know, I'd love to work with you. And so we ended up doing one track, uh, which is called Guajira, which is a flamenco track on this new album he did. And the day the album came out, it, it came out at number one in Billboard and it just got nominated for a Grammy as well. Except I don't get anything because I only did one track and you have to do 51% of the record. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. Which to me is like, he did the album in like 10 weeks and it took me three and a half months to do this one track, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a, well, you can get the certificate though, can't you? You get the, uh, yeah. uh, the uh, involved in the record that was the one or the If it wins, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. So tell us a little bit about your setup. Now you obviously, Record One is a legendary studio that you had and you made, in, you know what, you, you did, uh, um, Betty Davis size, didn't you? Yes, that record one. Yeah. yeah, and that won a Grammy. That was yeah. record of the year. Record of the year, song of the year. Yeah. And you engineered the records that Peter won producer of the year for. Yeah. So all the hits that Peter had from 1975 to 1981, I guess, all of them, I did every one of them. Yeah, it's wonderful. You've got. To look, we'll, we'll put the discography below. It's insane. It's one of the, to me, it's like the sound of the 70s, if you don't mind me saying yeah. that. 
Thanks. <laughs> it's okay. And working in the current studios, the ones that still survive in, in Los Angeles, which is basically Sunset Sound, Sunset Sound Factory, United, there's about half a dozen left, as you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't avoid it. Wherever I go into these rooms, I see your name all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so look, um, can you tell us a little bit about your setup? Um, I see you have the D command here. I do. Do you do you like it? What's, what's, um, uh, I love the D command. I love it better than the new S six. Uh, sorry about that, Avid. Um, it's okay. With everything you. on the S six is to me, it's too layered and too small. Right. And I help them design the Icon series, and I help them design the HD3 systems. Oh, wow. And then the engineers came up, uh, down here from Daily City, and we had lots of conversations. At the time, I had a, a fairly extensive pro control setup. And I said to them, listen, you, you can't really make a, a console that you can pick up in one end. It just, it's a toy. So that's when they started building these things, and the big icon that's on its own frame, I mean, it weighs, you know, a thousand pounds. So that's a real console. The S6 is like this toy again. Right. And the problem with Avid for me is that they don't confer with the, with the you know, the marketplace, the people that do this for a living. They just build. They design and build, and this is what we're doing, and you got to take it. But I don't think they're having a lot of success with that console. And the other thing that was weird is that I did a full page ad for Avid and they came in here and they photoshopped in the blackface version of this and they photoshopped out all the uh, Apogee stuff, (laughs) which I find funny, you know. Right. You have a combination of... uh... I like them both. I like the ADX and uh, and I like the HDIO. I like them both. Uh, So you like me, you keep it 48? Yeah, I, I do everything right now at 48 because um, space, and I'm in Pro Tools 10, but I just um, in the, am in the process. I just purchased the, the new 12 system with the trash can computers and, um, you know, a complete upgrade to Pro Tools 12, which means that it's now 64-bit, and at that point I'll go to um, uh, 90, 96K. Because, well, you know, it's really then, you know, the space is so cheap now. Yeah, So doubling the drive space, I bought, you know, I bought one of those um, chassis that, that you can, you know, can contain the, the uh, Avid card as well as a UAD card if you want. And it also has a chassis that slides in it that contains three, three terabyte drives. Right. Because you can't put drives on that trash can and it's got a flash drive and that's it. So... With three three terabyte drives, then I I don't have a space problem if I want to run at ninety six. I haven't done it yet, and I'm 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 thinking about doing it soon. I'm basically it's not s- cheap. Yeah, it's not cheap, and you know that that's only for a year. When you buy Pro Tools, and they're gonna, there's a yearly fee now. They're going well, you don't have to buy it again the next year, but you lose support, and if there's an upgrade, you lose that. So it's three ninety nine every year for each system, and I have two systems. Because, see, I record on this system, which is in that quiet box behind there. Right. It's an HD3 system. And then I mix through the Josh Florian into this other HD. Uh, at, um, this one is an HD native. So this is the mix machine at 192. I see. And that goes through that Florian converter. I don't know those converters. You don't? No, I don't. Josh Florian? Well, <clears throat> if you go to Bernie Grunman, that's what he uses. If you go to the Mastering Lab, that's what he uses. If you right. go to um, Eric Bollinger, that's what he uses. All the big mastering rooms that are really high-end use Josh's converter. Uh, he was a graduate 10 years ago out of Berkeley in Boston, and Doug Sachs found him, and he started designing converters, and it's just... I tried them all, man. We tried that. We tried uh, um, the head converters. We tried all the high-end stereo uh, converters, and that one is just... The only problem with it is is it's it's AES, so you have to have uh, a unit to have it talk to the computer. So I just bought another HDIO that's just the digital part. It's not a converter. Oh, I see. So it goes digitally from the, the computer through that back to that and vice versa. 
No, it's a new one for me. I'm, I'm excited to. And then to these two the machines outside. lock up. Right. Uh, so you can just print as many mixes as you want if you're doing, you know, um, versions. Right. So, so, so if I were to open this session, I'll show you how it works. So now if I flip this, as we're playing it, if I flip this input switch off, then you're hearing this only. So it's. <laughs> You can't really tell the difference. No, it's pretty amazing. 192 with that converter. The way it works is it comes out of the Pro Tools. Yep. Up there in the patch bay. And then from the Pro Tools, it goes over to the input of the fulcrums which are these analog summing devices. I wonder what those are there. Yeah, they're made by, um, um, what's uh, uh, Justin's company called? Roll Music. And, and he designed these <clears throat> as uh, totally passive analog summing devices. So if you, if you want track 17 on the left, yep. it's punched to the left. If you want in the middle, it's punched there. And if you want it to the right, it's there. If you want a stereo, you have to use two IOs, and you pan between them. One right. be left, one be right. What we're trying to get them to build is a box where this side. So you're panable. Yeah. Right. So you make... can do it on one channel as opposed to having to use two mm -hmm. for a stereo track. Because if this is panable, then I can pan it anywhere I want. So exactly. he's in the process of doing that now. But the output of these has to be gained up. So the way you do that is with preamps. And what preamps are you using? The first two, which are the BAE Avitas op amp 312s. Great. Which sounds sensational. Yeah, they do. And they're, uh, Vetus is the kid who basically redesigned what Saul Walker did with the 312 in terms of the... Uh, op amp, the 2520, and they sound sensational. The new ones the, with the red knobs, which we've been testing, <clears throat> um, don't sound as good as, the, as those do. They're a little softer, which I don't really love, so he's going to make a change. No, I agree. I mean, for me, in my well, humble he did opinion, it because he said digital, everything was so hard that maybe it needed that. Sure. But when you have all this great front end stuff on everything, it doesn't mm -hmm. end up hard. Yeah, I understand. I see his logic. He was probably trying to get yeah. the tape saturation. Right, but... But I love... The thing about APIs that we love is that the yeah. transients are so yeah, super exactly. fast. And that's, yeah. and that's all based on the fact that the inputs to all this API gear is unbalanced. That's the way, you know, when Saul Walker designed it, that's how he got that. You'd take 2 dB of 10K and go, and you heard it. Yeah. You know? And API cues are just, as you're saying, incredible sound. So we were just touching off camera about your speaker selection, which I think is wonderful. Um, my friend Dave Jordan uses these two. Um, he first turned me on to them. You probably were before him using them. Um, I've had those 30 years, but the, but the reason that I migrated, it, it's funny, Tannoy's to me, I never liked the sound of Tannoy speakers. When Doug Sachs decided to build crossovers for him mm -hmm. in the mastering lab, that's when it interested me. And the reason that I like them is I grew up on Altec 604Es. And that's a coaxial speaker. Right. The tweeter is not separate from the woofer. And Which these is... have the same exact coaxial setup. So it sounds very familiar to me that way. Um, that's why I like them. And, the, and they sound sensational to me. They, they, I, don't, I don't, any speakers that I've tried, and I've tried them all from Genelex to ATCs, you name it, uh, nothing sounds as good as this pair. These were always really paired really well with NS10s. I always remember that. Mm -hmm. That was like, they were like less fatiguing. You could listen to for longer. I think something about this coaxial design, it just it comes at you more directly. Even when we're between these two speakers, I love the mid-range of these. I mean, yeah. it's very, I'm very familiar it's, with this. Well, they're very mid-range, and yeah. that's what 604Es were. Right, I see. So the, to me, they're very inefficient speakers. So if you make something sound good on those, I don't care what you play them on, they're going to sound good. Right. And that's kind of the theory, you know. Yep, great speakers. And yes, it's all about this crossover, the Mastering Lab crossover. Right. 
I think I heard a pair with and a pair without once. Oh, it's night and day. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a funny Tanai story. When I first did um, Heart Like a Wheel with Linda Ronstadt, Peter Asher insisted that we master that record with Bernie Grunman, which is the only time in my career I ever mastered a record with anybody but Doug Sachs. So we went over to Bernie's mastering studio at A&M, which is now Henson. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. And he had a pair of these, and but they didn't have this crossover in them. So it just shows you what familiarity breeds. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if you remember the track, uh, You're No Good, but it had a fun, yeah, but the track had this unbelievable bottom end to it. In fact, I'll play it. I can play it. Now listen to the bottom of that. I mean, it's huge. It's beautiful. I mean, that's big bottom. When you consider that's 40 years ago. So he puts it up on the tape machine and the thing starts to play and there is no bottom end. And I'm like freaked. I'm looking at Peter and he's looking at me and we're like, holy shit, did we <laughs> blow this that bad? And Bernie turns around and he goes, listen to the fucking bottom on that. <laughs> <laughs> so to him, it was immense and we heard nothing. <laughs> but that's, he listened to those speakers for years, you know? Ah. You know, so to him it was huge. To us it was zero. We, yeah. we were like, you know? I've had those experiences, you've probably had these as well, where you, some mastering guys, you go into the room and the, the bottom I couldn't, end is so... I, I d I've not had that experience. That was the it? only time you, I went... I is that the, the only mastering time not lab used Doug for the Sachs? rest of my life. Wow. Until Doug died six months ago, I'd never mastered a record anywhere else besides wow. the mastering lab. Who do you use now? Eric Bollinger, who worked with Doug for the last 10 years. I see. You know, I mean, it's the same methodology, you know. Mm -hmm. Eric, uh, here. He's a great kid. Great studio, too. The bakery. Yeah. And it's called the bakery because his last name is Bollinger, which means bakery in French. It's on the lot at Sony in Culver City in a screening room that he built it into a mastering room. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, it's a fantastic room. I'd love to visit him. Yeah, well, ring him up. Go visit it. You should. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you were then telling me, it's a nice little tip, I and mean, we need to talk about this because you said you've been talking to Chris, CLA, and he had told you about these. Well, he had a, uh, when I was over to the studio one day, he had a, 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 a boom box I that sounded boombox. amazing. And I'm like, Chris, what the fuck is this? I need <laughs> one of these. He goes, well, here's the secret. And he showed me this subwoofer that was down on the floor under the console. And that's why that boom box sounded like that. So I said, well, that sounds pretty good. He goes, yeah, they're great subwoofers and they're cheap. Because I bought a pair of Genelex, the 1030s, and the subwoofer for those was $2,800. I, I, I know. <laughs> yeah. This was 80. A little cheaper. Yeah. And it's the Infinities? Yeah. Those are fantastic. BU2. BU2. BU2, great. And, and so, I always thought, as you start approaching all these sample drum sounds, you kind of need something subsonic to f really be able to f feel and hear what's going on down there. So I got one of these and put them on the tannoids and they were like, you know, once I got it dialed in, you have to be very critical about how much of that you use. And, you know, Brandon and I must have played around with that for <sighs> weeks. And when we got it where we liked it, then it was pretty easy to do it with these. So there was no question in my mind that I had to have a subwoofer for those when when Brad Lundy said, we're going to make you a set of passive speakers at ATC, I was like, wow. Great. Yeah. And you're driving both of these with the Bryston? For BST, which they haven't made since, what, when was the year? 95 they made that? Yeah, they made the Pro version in 95. They made a 4B SST, which I didn't like. The 4B ST, probably the best amp Bryston's made. Fantastic. Yeah. So you're keeping some continuity. You have the two Infinities, you've got driving each one separately. You've got the Brystons, so 
And we just had a comparison a little earlier between the two. Mm -hmm. I do still really love the mid-range. Well, those speakers, lift your arm up. Mm -hmm. No, no, lift your arm up. Those speakers are, <laughs> uh, those speakers, you know, a lot of people have had those and a lot of people have heard these and everybody that's heard them, including Doug Sachs, says they never heard a pair sound as good as these. Wow. So I just lucked out, you know. Be careful with those drivers. <laughs> well, no, Chris, uh, Chris Kasabian, who's reconed these twice, both the, the woofer and the tweeter, has parts for these. Oh, he does? Yeah. They've been reconed twice. You know, over the years, they fatigue, so. We just sent them over to him how long ago? Two months ago to have him, you know, test them to make sure they're still okay, and he said they're fine. So, so he basically got probably a bunch of new old stock from Tano and keeps them. He does in storage. Nicely yeah. done. Um, now the Oratones, those look are they custom made? Yeah, Chris Kasabian made those for me. They're his custom made ones. They sound really good. So here I'll show you. Oh, I like those. Yeah. I feel so black. And, and the thing that's nice about them is, is that they're finished real nice. If you walk around back, you can see, I can't turn around because they're set angle-wise, okay. but they're finished, like really pretty in the back with the gold plugs. And did he also do these then, the ns No. Oh. I did those Delicious. myself. Those used to be oak colored, like record one, but I got tired of explaining them, so I had them <laughs> painted black, <laughs> you know? And let's get on to these then, because these are your own design. Well, originally, way back when I first came up with the idea for these, <clears throat> I went to Yamaha and said, why don't we make these? And they said, that sounds like a great idea. So we started talking and negotiating. That was when Yamaha was talking to the musical community, both instrumentally and um, electronically, you know, like they were making basses for Lee Scalar and guitars for Wadi Wachtel and all that stuff. So um, I even had a logo, which is funny because <clears throat> the logo that John Kosh designed for me for those is the logo that I still use on my business card. And it was originally, they were going to be called uh, Super uh, 10Ms. And that was the logo. Ah, like Mark uses, is using now on the, uh, the DI box. Yeah, it, and basically I got the idea from the 1939 Ford V8 logo. Very That's nice. what the logo looked like, except it was an eight, and I had them made into a G. That's so, so these boxes, uh, to me the problem with the stock NS10 box is that it was just a shade too small. So I had to make the box a half inch bigger ID, which just means inside dimensions yep. in every direction. And then the face of the NS10 box is three quarter inch particle board mm -hmm. and three quarter inch um, um, MDF. These are three quarter inch marine plywood and three quarter inch particle board. And then the box itself is birch faced particle board. And then <clears throat> I sat down with Art Kelm, who was my chief engineer at the time, and I said, we need to come up with an idea for crossovers. He had gone and found a company that made crossovers for NS10s called Hemisphere. They were called Hemisphere Time Align crossovers. So you use the same plate that holds the coils on the back. You can see it still has a Yamaha plate on the back. And it bolts to the box. Larry made the box so it had this, the, the screws in it so that this plate bolts, that there's four screws that the plate just sits on. I see. Yep. And all the coils and everything are still in there that are stock Yamaha coils. Then the coils get modified. Caps or however they do it. So we have the drawing now for how they made the, the crossovers. So that was the change in the, in the crossover. And then Yamaha and I could never come to an agreement. So the whole thing fell in the tank. Did they, I mean, is it, Where's it crossed over? Is it higher or lower? Because uh, you know, I don't remember. Because I don't really remember, but I, but I know that that they're 
fairly different than the stock Yamaha cross. Because I'm, 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 the sort of build up for me on these is like one and a half K is like through the roof, you know, which we get yeah, and the NS10 and, is, and the, and the funny know, part and the funny part is is that they came out with the NS10 Studio, yes, which had a different tweeter in it. It's no different whatsoever. All they did was they put a felt damper around the inside of that ring. Oh, they did. So the tweeter is exactly the same as the original one. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, the mid-range on, on, on them is incredible. I mean, I still have a pair. I don't reference them as not much as anymore, I Not anymore, though. I mean... Yeah. The mid-range is not... Um, the mid-range in these is... The thing is how loud you can play them. Without your ears bleeding. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't bother you. Wonderful. And those are being driven by the Bryson as well? No. Those are, are, those are driven by this phase linear 400, which I love to death. That's this down here? Yeah, and they're hard to find too. Brandon got one. He found one. Oh, you did, Brandon? Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's talk about the uh, 10 DCF. Okay. You had some, uh, we talked about it briefly on, off camera, and you had some things that you had Mark do specifically for you. So I'd love to know a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the thing that I loved about the Manly stereo compressor, this variable mu, is two things. It's stepped, so when you go to recall it, we, you know, when we recall mixes, we use a thing called T-Boy. Are you familiar with that? No, I don't. Okay. Got that. Got to Br know bring this. that up, Brandon, on the screen. T-Boy is an English company, obviously an English company, <laughs> <laughs> that makes um, online storage of a way of saving mixes exactly as they were done. So That's exciting. with this, because it's stepped, you, you can copy it exactly. If something isn't stepped, then you have to guesstimate where the knobs are. You can get pretty close. So if you look at this. There's the 10 DCF. Yeah, pull up the, and you gotta send them a note to get, to get the version with the filter in it. Yeah. Pull up the, uh, the Manly, so you can see what I'm talking about. So it's the exact replica of the equipment and you can, you can actually change the settings. So if I wanted to move this to, you know, say it was, this was really not in, it was out, or in, or this was really uh, seven and a half, not seven. That's fantastic. Yeah, and and they make every piece of gear there is. Wow. It's like a... And it's like 90 bucks a year, and so all these mixes, if I go to um, this, open, save the song note, and I go to this, this is where all these mixes are saved. It's fantastic. In T-Boy. And it also gives you paths. What a great name, T-Boy. Yeah, so if you want the <laughs> path of this, this is a Vox, this is a, on a, her voice, and then all these compressors are calibrated. Mm -hmm. And Evita's taught us how to do that. Oh, he did. That's fantastic. Yeah. So let Brandon explain it because he does it all the time. Okay. <clears throat> Moving to Brandon here. Uh, so if we want to notate where the ins and outs are on the compressor, we'll send a tone to it and uh, we'll, we'll uh, see what the output is. Say the tone's like uh, plus four perfect and then so the output will be like six. So we know like the combined input and output is putting out plus two dB or, or plus six, we'll call it. And then you floor the output and that gives you the level of the input, which is gonna be up higher. So it's gonna be like 16. And then you can bring that back down. So if you wanted to bring back that setting, you floor the output and you put the input to where that level is and then you bring the output up to the combined level. So no matter, so, so if you've got a different voltage that day, you can still recall it. 
I suppose that's yeah, well, really because kind of the, what happens is is like that's great. like I'll reach over and change the input a little bit. Sure. See, they all start out calibrated. We have a calibration setting that's all calibration. Right. Then if I change the input a little bit, then when he goes to to um, save the session, if you see it combined is eleven point eight one and the input is fourteen point four six, and that compressor can be set back exactly as it was. Wow. Well. But what I like about that is if there's a change in voltage, you can recall how it, it, the knobs will be in a different place, but you would achieve exactly the same result. Mm -hmm. That's pretty fantastic. Yeah. That's good. And then it also shows That's the lot. path. So it's coming out of mixed five in the API mix. I don't know if, I don't know if the, uh, you've obviously worked in many studios in England, but the T-boy was the... So sort of the, the first rung of the yeah. assistant, you know. Yeah. You were the T-boy. But that's a great name for that. Yeah, that's right? why I'm in. It's, it's and the equivalent of the intern, I suppose. And, yeah, and this is what the, um, this is what the, uh, their uh, icon looks like. <laughs> it's a mouse with an iced tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, they're, trying, they're making sure the Americans know what it is. But the company <laughs> is in England. That's fantastic. That's a great... Great idea. So with the 10 ZCF, yes. um, you basically took the sidechain function. From the yeah, because t to me, if you're going to run stereo bus compression, you know, which I, which I did for years with Linda and James, I always had an LA3A that I had special optics put into it for, that were faster. And all I did was tickle it, you know, just to give it that little bit of blue. And so when I started getting into stereo compression and I, and, and I talked to Ivana, they sell this mastering version for like, I don't know, it's a couple thousand dollars more than the regular version, but it's all stepped. Right. And I don't know if the regular version has the sidechain filter in it, but this one does. And when I started playing around with it, it was just unbelievable because kick and snares always drive these things. Yeah. And when it doesn't, it, it allows you to do a lot of interesting things that don't, you know, get squashed as easily. Absolutely. Your kick, basically, what I was saying is like the kick drum isn't smashing the mix, right. which is what happens most of the time. I mean, sometimes if you're, if you're creating EDM music, you want that to happen, you know, so everything is pulsing, you know, but that's simple, you know, you do that, I side do chain. that with a side chain, yeah. you know, let the kick drum drive it. But, so when I, when I, you know, in the process of doing all these things with Mark, um, we had the 10 DCs without the side chain in them. And I said, Mark, we, we got to get one of these with a side chain because it's like night and day. And bam, like overnight. He did it's it. now your, your mix bus compressor? Well, for rock stuff, no question. For softer, prettier stuff, I'll use that sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I do like the very Muse. I, I think that I use them a lot on guitars because they almost tame the top end in a really I nice use way. Uh, 1176s on guitars and I have a pair of you know the newer stereo pair they do a stereo one well it's not well yeah you can actually use it stereo but it's it's a two in one box this one right here oh I see the two set 1176 yeah. I like the styling they make it look like the uh, the 50s ones. Nice, you're using it, you're using it quite gently. You've got a, where are you set, like two to one? Is that right? Well, which one are you looking at? I'm using the one on the right. Uh, oh, the 10DC? Oh, the 10 DCs. Yeah, yes, 10 two to one, yes. With basically, what we did with that was we kind of copied the settings and attack and release times, uh, everything of the Manly, the way we have the Manly set up. <laughs> The only thing we couldn't mimic was the 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 filter frequency. That one is is at eighty, right, Brandon? Yeah. And the Manly's at a hundred. <laughs> but that's close enough. Yeah, and probably one person's eighty is another person's hundred anyway with these things. Exactly. <laughs> that's fantastic. And then, yeah, it's amazing what it was doing playing back. It's hard to tell through our little uh, our little uh, microphones here, but the bottom end was just massive. Yeah. Fantastic it's device. Yeah, really, really great. I love the way it sounds. I was using, Mark, let me borrow one for a week. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think we still have it. We've got to get send it back because I know we sold it already. Um, I liked it on tracking bass. 
Base, I'm a little bit funny about that. A, because I have my own direct box, which is a copy of the direct box I use for the last years. Yes, I know. I, ha I have one. You I, do? Yes. Oh, great. Well, I'll show you the original. <laughs> That's the reason why I said, oh, like the logo on your yeah. DI. I'll show you the original. The original is this one. That specific transformer oh, wow. Dean Jensen made way back in the 70s. That's fantastic. But Mark, being smart, you know, where this could get broken off... He buried it in the he side. He buried it on the side, yeah. And made the box a lot lighter and a lot yeah. smaller because this thing is pretty big and clunky. It's a lot smaller and it's, it's you know, he put that on the side of it so that it just kind of looks, looks better. It's fantastic. But that's the original and that's... The I new have one. one of these people. Good. I love it. <laughs> well, it's a great sound and here's what I do with bass. Uh, I basically... Don't do much to bass at all. Uh, I take a direct signal through this, through the you know the BAE preamp, or the, usually I use the 312, the stock API 312 on bass, and then I put it in an 1176 or an LA2A. But the LA2A that I use is a you know is a uh, Waves uh, plugin. and I put it on the aux input side so it's processing it that way, and I use a Pultec uh, PEQ1 with a little boost around 60 cycles, and that's all I do to the bass. Wonderful. And then on the amp side, um, uh, we add like a little bit of 7K on the amp and kind of match it and make sure it's phase matched, and the way I do it with, with, the, with the, the bass player is, the compressed side always goes to wherever it goes at the top because mm -hmm. it's compressed, so you can control the very top. The amp always seems to move inside of that, and so I set it so that when the guy really nails it, it gets up to where the direct signal is. So that gives you dynamics that the player actually plays, which That's you don't get right. with most people because they always compress everything. Sure. And I do it so that the amp side has the looseness of the playing. I see. And then the direct side has the compression. Which makes perfect sense. Yeah. Especially because DIs are so much more dynamic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's great. Nice tip. I got a load of those. <laughs> and here I'll show you. The best mic for electric guitars. Yep. Courtesy of Val Garay. On an amp. On an amp. Killer. There it is. Oh, it is a sure. I don't know the 53. Yeah, nobody does. But I'm telling you, that's the bee's knees when it comes to guitar knees. mics. And ask Brandon, because he's had every mic known to man he's tried. Right? Yeah. SM53. You can find them on the internet for like $80. Not after this. <laughs> oh, you can still to this day. No, not after this airs. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you better go on eBay and buy a whole bunch now. <laughs> well, it's like my acoustic guitar setup. It's uh, like when I was talking to Joe Barisi, he uses those AR-15s. It's, it's, like, it's, like it's like my acoustic guitar setup. What's, what's your favorite? We guitar? find these on the internet. How much are we paying for these? Those you can get for about 40 if you're really lucky. And this is what I use on acoustic guitar as well as the... C12A or 414 custom one that I have. I don't know this. And it's, and it's called a ECM50 PS, which means you don't need to put the battery in it. You can run it with a power supply. You run a power supply? Go grab the acoustic for a second, Brandon. So here's what I do. I'll show you. <clears throat> This is, the, this is James Taylor's guitar sound. This is James Taylor's acoustic guitar sound. What acoustic is this? This looks absolutely beautiful. Oh, it is. Uh, we, we're going to have to come back, Val, and do like three hours. Blue Ridge. Oh, yeah. Hard to find. Oh, yeah. McCartney just signed with them. Who did? McCartney. He did? Yeah. Beautiful. So this is what I do. So this goes here. Oh, wow. And the 414 goes here. 
and that's how I record acoustic guitars. You know what? That was a lot of fun, and I'd rather be here for like six hours and go through all the tips. We've got okay. two mic tips, which I think are gold dust. Well, anytime, man. You know, we're here. We're not going anywhere. Did out. you hear that? Did you hear that? You heard that, Brandon? Yeah, anytime. Heard that. Come anytime. on over. Thank you ever so much. Okay. You know, I'm, Cheers. To be honest, I didn't... I was talking to Colin on the way over. I was like, we could just kind of get into a record and start like, you know. But the thing is, is you're here and you're making great music. It's interesting because all the cutting edge stuff, like you're talking about the concerts and stuff, comes from guys like you. Mm -hmm. Guys that you have ears Well, it's and funny because, knowledge. you know, the, th the thing that's always kept me... I mean, I, I know guys that I grew up with in the business, in the producer or engineer field, that kind of fell by the wayside because they got stuck in whatever genre they fell in love with. Sure. I've always loved cutting edge technology. You do it. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, Brandon can tell you, you know, he knows a lot of kids his age. He's under 30. Um, I know more about this stuff than most of them. Oh, I believe it. Trust me. I just learned like probably three or four things that I didn't know anything about. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm always on top of that because I love being... I mean, you can ask him. We uh, There's times when I have to go down to Apogee and get Roger Robindor, who's their chief engineer, to help me get the software to work because I'm so far in front of the curve. I believe or, it. or the same thing happens, you know, with whatever. Like, he's going to drop the new Symphony 2 off because he wants me to try it because I have the... ADXs, and I bought a Symphony when it first came out, but I didn't like the way it sounded. I liked the HDIO better, so he was trying to get me back in the fold with that thing, you know. Well, I'm gonna put some links down below for your for your DI, mm -hmm. uh, the 10 DCF, mm -hmm. the things that you're involved with, because you're eclectic, you're using a lot of people's equipment. You're not loyal to one thing. You're I, hopefully I, I I model myself on you somewhat. We use what the best of we can of anyone's particular manufacturers. Yeah, right. And I love that. So I feel, you know, a lot of times people are trying to hock things. You're not. You just make great stuff and you're involved with great stuff. So we'll put some links down below and we'll put some links to those two mics as well so people okay, can look them up. <laughs> <laughs> make sure, Brandon, you go on eBay and buy He's whatever's got available. Him. He already has <laughs> it. All right. Thank you ever so All much. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Leave loads of questions and comments below. And if there's some good ones, I might even call him up and ask them. Thanks very much.